Sigoli, Nadio Lewis, Skenagoga, Skenago means greetings. What is the news? Are you with peace? I am with peace in Oneida. It is an honor. It is a privilege to put our minds together. I'm so grateful to be with you all. Cannot believe we are already about to enter week six right now of our seven week course. So it has been wonderful. And as we get started here today, I just want to give thanks to the creator, have some of our medicines here to put in the centerpiece, which would be some Oneida grown sage and Oneida grown tobacco. So here in the middle, so Oneida grown sage here to ward off some negativity and some Oneida grown tobacco here. And this is to make requests to the creator, to give thanks to the creator and to ask for guidance. So we have these, our tobacco and our sage, got our eagle feather here, gift it from my grandmother, very grateful for that. So as we get started here today, just thanking the creator for putting our minds together. Just let us have good hearts, good minds and strong fires, love for ourselves, our, our families and our worlds, being at peace, having a generous sense of humor and having a strong spiritual flame, recognizing that your flame can ignite other people's as well too. So it's week six, it's great to be with you all. Want to tell, I think I've told you this story before, but I want to remind you, as we used our last group meet to envision this future, which can be simultaneously exciting and frustrating to, to remind us of where we are now, where we would like to be. But I would like to remind you that the gift that you all have is a vision. So there's a story I was told from Arch, which is May Elder, and they were telling this story. There's this time that all of creation was together. And at this time, a bear was like, look what I can do. And this big bear took a tree, rips it to the ground and puts it, throws it on the ground. This deer says, well, look what I can do. And the deer comes by and jumps over the tree in one move and keeps going. And then the human being closes its eyes and says, well, look what I can do. If I close my eyes, I can imagine a world like this one only better. And it is our responsibility as human beings to bring people to that imagined future, to bring people to that imagined place. That is our responsibility as human beings with that gift of vision. So all the vision that you all have, and I was asking to wave that magic wand, when I have my master in public administration, we've used that phrase a lot in terms of how do you imagine this future where you want to be, then reverse engineer to get to get there, to realize, okay, the status quo is a decision in itself. If we want to continue the things as they are, that is a, that's a conscious decision that we want to continue on, or we want to change and try to go somewhere else and do something else and try to be more restorative. This is a text, uh, a picture from this book, The Sacred Tree. And it's this notion here that I'll, I'll read it. We gain a vision of what our potential is from our elders and from the teachings of the sacred tree by trying to live up to what that, by trying to live up to that vision and by trying to live like the people we admire, we grow and develop. Our vision of what we can become is like a strong magnet pulling us toward it. So if you see, it's almost like this, this vision from these 30 different elders across Turtle Island. Imagine this uh, as this tube-like idea that you have your mental, spiritual, physical, emotional, and then your volition is your, your will to go to, to, um, to continue forward. And then your, your vision, you see that it's, it's on the, the distance of what you're moving towards, what you're, what you're doing. So as we hold the eagle feather here, having that vision like an eagle to go up there to have that near cosmic energy of going up and above um, as a liaison between us and the spirit world. So re reminder to have that vision as well too, as we're working through to try to create that imagined future as all of you, your vision that you have is indeed a gift. It is really. Here's some 12 teachings from the sacred tree. And again, it's from over 30 el elders across Turtle Island. And some of these concepts are wholeness, change, change occurs in cycles or patterns the seen and the unseen. Human beings are spiritual as well as physical. Human beings can always acquire new gifts, but they must struggle to do so. There are four dimensions of true learning. Spiritual dimensions has four related capacities. Human beings must be active participants in the unfolding of their own potentialities. The doorway of the will or volition must be passed through if someone wishes to become more or different than they are now. Anyone who sets out will be aided the only source of failure on a journey will be the traveler's own failure to follow the teachings of the sacred tree. So it's put forth by these elders, these carriers of thought and wisdom from across Turtle Island, otherwise known as North and South America. And also a reminder as well too, I know currently we have our three different systems of branches, our three branches of government, which would be our legislative, we are lawmakers like the House of Representatives and the Senate. You have your executive branch, which would be your president. You have your judicial branch, which would be that, um, those in the court systems, the Supreme Court, different things. Uh, I was recently reminded as I listened to that Broken Law podcast I recommended to you all. And it was spoken by Professor Maggie Blackhawk, who's a professor of law at the NYU School of Law. And it talks about how Congress has the ability to pass a statute to overrule a decision that's put out by the Supreme Court. Um, and it's sending a signal to the Supreme Court to not overstep their boundaries. A reminder by Professor Blackhawk that Congress has powers under the constitution that we give it credit. And it's really a call to action here. 
for when you see something, right? When to be the change you want to see in the world that we are the leaders we've been waiting for, the words of Grace Lee Boggs, this notion that to contact your member of Congress, we could do this tomorrow if folks took it up and made it their issue today. So it's this, this call to, uh, instead of waiting for this change to happen, waiting for other people to take up this change by awareness with great power comes great responsibility as we're reminded uh, from Uncle Ben and, and the comics with Spider-Man and also from my own great great uncle Ben, but this notion with great uncle, with great power comes great responsibility. And so how do we do this? But we can contact Congress and they can make changes. They, they can and put pressure upon them that they are serving you as your elect, as their elected, your elected official. Uh, it's a good point brought up as well too from the readings from week five, just some pushback and tension with you all, which I really appreciate that so much as we're reminded to speak with honesty and to share with honesty. Just a lot of idea of people being skeptical, the idea of how can this be used in domestic violence, people who've been exposed to domestic violence themselves and being uh, very skeptical um, and for, for ethical reason, right? That's, that's a, those, are some, those are some really serious harms and that's okay. And I think even recognizing the fact that restorative justice um, an ideal world to be working for all cases. In, in reality, right, it's a case by case, very situational has been noted before as well too. So it kind of depends, right, whether that could work or not in that certain case, depending on the severity, depending on the willingness of the person who was harmed and who did the harm, right? It's uh, um, some of the ideas though is acknowledging the emotional harm that takes place. Less of a focus on coercion of trying to coerce the person who caused the harm to, to be a part of it, but really a focus on healing. So if you're coercing someone, it's, it's, it's not gonna work. This person has to want to have accountability if they've caused harm to try to repair that harm. Um, some hindrances as well too pointed out was just rage and a lack of accountability. Um, I think it's, it seems common sense, but also just it's a great reminder to point out as much as we'd love for these processes to work with everyone and anyone. Um, if someone is in a point of blind rage, right, just seeing red, so to speak, if someone has this lack of accountability, well, it's, it's going to be really difficult to make any kind of restoration possible. Uh, there is this notion of shuttle diplomacy, of, so of having a restorative practitioner having a peacemaker go in between as a liaison and speaking for both the harm party and those who did harm. That's one option as well, too. But indeed, I think it's very for rightful reason the pushback and the tension. And I really appreciate you all voicing that. That just shows how transparent and honest you are. And that's the honesty and accountability you have to have um, if we really are to make true change to realize where we are, where we are at, what is the litmus test of what is actually going on out around us and what are people's values. So I have this notion in an ideal world of having circles before you need them. That's one of my practitioner friends, Duke Fisher, reminds me all the time. You need to have circles before you need them. This is a picture here of Salmon River, Salmon River Central, which is a middle school out in upstate New York, and it is right near Canada and right near the Ganyagiaga or Mohawk Territory. 67% uh, 67 of the student body is native, uh, being predominantly from the Ganyagiaga or Mohawk. Um, and I've just had the wonderful opportunity to teach these people some about their, our peacemaking roots as Haudenosaunee people. So something that we've been doing since 1142, reminding, remembering as a community and Haudenosaunee people doing it together, uh, it's been a great honor. And there definitely have some conflicts that have arisen, um, even just the year or so I've been, I've been there, a lot of community building. And then it's been great because when you have conflict that arise, you already are, are comfortable with the circle format. You're already, um, students, people, and everyone are already used to talking in this, in this idea. They're used to listening in this, in this format as well too. So chapter seven and chapter eight, which you'll be doing from this Navajo Nation peacemaking, some excerpts I found from you. One is in chapter seven of I Am His Brother, from page 133. One of the goals of, I apologize if I mispronounce here, uh, Yada Ya, which means upward bound in Diné, was to use traditional ceremonies to bring the young clients back to harmony when the peacemakers felt this approach was warranted. This one here from chapter eight, Navajo Nation's Courts and Peacemaking, page 153. Native Americans are justifiably afraid that the dominant society will continue to impose social institutions on them that are not in their best interests. Although legal pluralism is an undeniable fact in the United States, meaning having the tribal law, state law, and federal law, mainstream American society is not known for its tolerance or respect for difference. One of the underlying issues that must be acknowledged is the possible threat to peacemaking that could come from a perceived lack of legitimacy. So uh, just some of the points that are put, up, put out there. That was on 152, I apologize. This is one from 153. Sharing strategies and ideas can only make them all stronger. So figuring out how we best do this, putting our minds together. So be it in our minds, trying to get those best practices, best ideas, and recognizing this, that, that barrier, right? That there is this stigma, this notion of perhaps a primitive, right? These are really offensive ideas, but they're ones that I've heard before, right? a savage of this backwards, um, these people being uh, Native Americans not being sophisticated enough in their decision-making and their, what language, religion, uh, when in reality, this cannot be farther from the truth, right? These, these are, those are forms of genocide that dehumanize people. Uh, when in reality, these, these thoughts of law have been going on um, and thoughts of law and justice for 
over a thousand years for different communities. This is the Haudenosaunee for nearly a thousand years since 1142, our form of our, our circle process, which would, was still going on to this day for how we make decisions at our longhouse. So what, what, one of the readings you can do this week is uh, my dissertation here, some excerpts from it, as you'll see on module six, you can see just the pages to read there that are really focused on circles, the things I wanted to highlight for you. That's about Oneida College lacrosse players' perspectives of the sacred game of lacrosse. And that was such an honor. We did about, we played, each of us played lacrosse for about half an hour before. I sent them each that tobacco and that um, sage that I showed you all at the beginning here. I also had stick maker Dana Isaac send, uh, make these wooden lacrosse sticks that we use as talking pieces and was sent to them as well too. All the different, my 12 co-collaborators. So shout out all my Oneida co-collaborators. Let's go, Dan. Let's go, Dan. <laughs> Very grateful for each and every one of you. Y'all one co, thank you, Oneida. But that's just a, an excerpt of that so you can get an idea of it. Um, really sacred, our time together. One of the things that the takeaways that's coming to me right now was how sacred our silence was in between speaking. I'll sometimes go into different circles um, and it seems like Western formats and different ideas where it can be like an awkward silence or people don't know what to do with the silence. But in our circles, it was so powerful. It, that's what it felt like ceremony was the silence that held us, and the bonds between us in our understanding. And even when we were not speaking, we were still held together as a circle, albeit across Turtle Island, different places that are different universities doing it digitally over Zoom during the, the pandemic era, but it was powerful. It was a spiritual and a profound experience and really grateful for. So grateful for my wife for helping me edit that, Julia. And, um, but yeah, I'd like for y'all to take, take a look at that and see what you think. Here's some different notes I was talking about before too. Just those 30 minutes of lacrosse before you circle. I also did Instagram weekly talking circles. I did a personal journal weekly reflections while going through my research. So a lot of research, but uh, some good takeaways. Your week six videos here, leaning more into these different practices across Turtle Islands with different tribal nations and across the world as well too, as you'll look at here, indigenous talking circles of the UN, shine a light on the importance of sacred plants. I like that one as well too, just the notion of different indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, what that looks like. Looking here again at Legend Lake, looking at the use of it in the medical field with uh, diabetes, uh, a talking circle at the Sacramento Native American Health Center. And then also restorative justice and harmony with indigenous peoples, another video as well here too. So there's just some videos I want you all to check out. Some other optional videos here is one of the learning outcomes for this week is this notion of overrepresentation of native people systemically. One of my colleagues, Dr. Kimberly Robertson have pointed out in their research that since 1492, native peoples have been per capita the most, over, the most populated people, most incarcerated people. Um, obviously we have other people of color that are disproportionately represented as well too. And, face oftentimes we've seen cases of historical trauma and cases of, of violence against people of color who are unarmed or having the system be used against people of color oftentimes. Uh, so this is, a, this is we're honing in specifically as we're looking to look at native peoples within this, the First Nations in Canada, and as well as people here, particularly in the United States, just as overrepresentation of native peoples in this criminal justice system that we have now, in this legal system and our uh, systemically, as has been pointed out, so what does that look like? How do, how do we move forward from that? So there's some different experts and some different people talking on that as well too. I always bring it up and I'm bringing it up again. Free Leonard Pelletier would, would be a really important one. I, I think in restorative justice for the relationship between native communities and trust with the federal government. A film here, Incident in Oglala I'd recommend as well as the book, The Trial of Leonard Pelletier. Some people have requested pardon for Leonard Pelletier include the late Nelson Mandela, the Mother Teresa, the Dalai Lama, Archbishop Edmund, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and hundreds more religious and human rights leaders as well. There's currently a, a, a legal team taking up the case as well too, which is great to see that uh, they're still fighting for a pardon, hopefully here from President Biden. Uh, so there was hopes for President Obama at the end of his second term to pardon Leonard Peltier, which did not happen. Some people were hoping that former President Trump will do the pardon. And then now it's, uh, we're hoping that as, Leonard Peltier is getting older. His health is, is um, diminishing over time, his physical health. So we just keep sending him well wishes and our prayers and positivity, but at the same time, doing whatever we can for all you legal activists out there, progressive prosecutors and people who are able to uh, use the wisdom and knowledge to help, um, to help free Leonard Peltier, who's been a political prisoner since 1977 for over 45 years. Some more optional videos on this notion of international restorative justice with tribal nations. As I, I was watching these earlier, just wanted to share them as they're bringing tears to my eyes in this Recognition of sovereignty and recognition of over time as well too, what it means to, to do acts of generosity, acts of kindness between peoples as circles you get as far as you get. And they also, it's, it's a continuous thing as well too, as you kind of keep making the circle bigger over time of what we're connected with and who we're connected with, the seven generations before us, seven generations after us. There's some powerful videos as well too, looking here how South Korea helped out the Navajo Nation, the Dene people, 
after, uh, during the Korean War, when many Native American people and code talkers specifically, there are over 33 different tribal nations who are code talkers. The Navajo, AKA the Diné, get a lot of credit as there was that film, Wind, Wind Talkers, that came out, I believe in 2002. Uh, but there were 33 different tribal nations. In this case, the South Koreans recognized that the Navajo nation was, I believe, being hit per capita higher than 48 other states in terms of the pandemic rates and, different, and how it was affecting their community, uh, particularly when over a third of the people do not have access to running water, which is really tough for people to wash their hands. Uh, there's some videos here as well, too, that talk about the Irish repaying a debt. I think it's from 1847. I believe it was around then where some people from the Choctaw Nation gave around 176 to 100. I forget what the number is. It's 176 or 173. I'm blanking at the moment. But it's in the 170s dollar region, which would now be roughly $5,000 today. And um, the uh, people in Ireland recognize that although a different nation, the Navajo, but still Native peoples were suffering from these high pandemic rates. They get a, a large amount of funds of over $1 million that was given from in donations from people in Ireland towards the Navajo Nation and peoples. So this time using finances to help people, but let them know it's really more of a support as people talk about in these videos. What that means is really this, this support of friendship, of loyalty, of kindred spirits. It's, it's a beautiful thing, powerful thing. It makes me very grateful for my, my roots and my, my heritage for my Irish relatives and for my own Idaho Nashoni relatives. It um, makes me very grateful. So I'd recommend you watching some of those videos if you're curious about on that. A great point here, one of our classmates, Kelly took this to me, but it's something I've been see, seeing as well too circulating on social media. And I'm the program manager for the Haudenosaunee National Development Team. So I do a little bit of the administrative work, a little bit of the politicking and arm twisting in terms of recognition of sovereignty, which should be inherent, in, inherent recognized thing we get from the creator, which it is, but just also just reminding people of that as well too. So this is a note here from Rex Lyons, who's the son of Chief Orrin Lyons. And we'll, we'll talk more about Rex in a moment here. Rex says, I want to express my deepest appreciation to the Irish and Team Ireland. It was the first time in the history of traveling on our Haudenosaunee passport that we were treated with such dignity and respect. Their custom officers met our entire delegation right as we stepped off the plane, escorted us through, escorted us through customs with all the necessary paperwork. And we were in Ireland without any issues whatsoever. Once again, showing the world how we can all treat each other better and build stronger, healthier relationships when the effort is put, put forth. Myanmar. Ireland. I believe that's a thank you in Onondaga, if I'm not mistaken. So just some notion and some history, some quick bullet points here. The Haudenosaunee traveled with their own passports, I believe since the 1970s, different countries representing themselves as their, especially for lacrosse, the creator's game, aka the medicine game, a game that was gifted to the creator, to the Haudenosaunee and other peoples, but the style we play most today in a modern version is most similar to the Haudenosaunee or Six Nations style. So the 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 Haudenosaunee, also formerly known as the Iroquois, but the Haudenosaunee, they traveled to the 1970s on these passports. Um, in it, it was a, I believe it was called a post 9-11 era and after 9-11, 2001, all the passports had different updates in terms of having to be scanned and having to have different barcodes, different things. Well, um, this was one of the reasons that was given in 2010, why England would not recognize the Haudenosaunee passports when the World Lacrosse Championships were held in England. Um, in 2014, it's not listed here, but the World Games would be, would be held in Denver. And this time the Haudenosaunee would be able to compete. And after the England did not allow them to compete in 2010, they beat them 14 to five uh, when they were in 2014 in Denver. And this as well too, recognizing that the Haudenosaunee in terms of world outdoor lacrosse, uh, I believe recently we just were now ranked fifth before that were ranked third in the world. And then for indoor lacrosse ranked second in the world, uh, first being Canada as well. Pulling from a, a player pool of anywhere I've seen the number as low as about 160, I've seen the number as high as about 360. And I've seen the player pools for Canada and the United States as low as about 600,000 and high as a couple million. So it's pretty amazing the Haudenosaunee are still able to be competitive and they're still able to be one of the best in the world, ambassadors and diplomats for a great sport, which we feel an honor to do so, as it is an honor. And for every game going on here, there's a game going on in the spirit world as well. So in 2015, the World Indoor Lacrosse Championships were hosted in Onondaga for the Haudenosaunee with 13 teams. In 2018, there was a delayed entry into Israel when the Haudenosaunee were supposed to be competing and, and they were supposed to have no issues whatsoever, but then these different issues happened where they were basically going, getting right off the plane, going into their first game against USA when everyone else had about roughly five or five or more days to get used to the jet lag, which is definitely a real thing. Many of the Haudenosaunee players never changed time zone, zones so significantly. Anyways. Going on here, 2022, Ireland gives us a spot up for the Haudenosaunee to compete in Birmingham, Alabama at what are called the World Games, which are qualifying events for the Olympics. And in 2028, it has not happened yet, but we're speaking it into fruition. We're manifesting it as Rex Lyons with his leadership has already has spoken to the Haudenosaunee and spoken to others as he envisions the Haudenosaunee holding the Olympic torch 
walking into the Los Angeles. I can't remember if it's going to be the Coliseum or where it's going to be at, at in, Los, in Los Angeles on Gabi Alenio Tongva on Shumash territory there as their uh, for the opening ceremonies of the Olympics and recognizing for the first time, allowing the Haudenosaunee to compete as their own sovereign nation as recognized by others. Is, I'm someone like myself with a dual citizen of the Haudenosaunee in the United States, but for many Haudenosaunee peoples, and it still is important when competing for the Haudenosaunee, this is the passport we wish to, this is the passport we, we used to use when, when competing for our nation we're representing. So this is a, a note about that here. So shout out to Kelly for sending that. And also for all, just recognizing all the, the lacrosse community. I would first seen that one from Kurt Summers, my coach in Oneida, Wisconsin. So shout out Kurt Summers. Thank you, coach. RJ is a tool for healing. Just this notion that the way I was taught it, it's a reminder that my cousin, Eddie Cornelius, taught me that healing through intergenerational trauma is um, using intergenerational resiliency and strength. I'm a third generation survivor of Indian boarding school where my great grandfather, Anderson William Cornelius, was forced to attend Carlisle Indian Boarding School. The motto was to kill the Indian, to save the man. We've talked about some of the horrible things he's heard and saw and witnessed with a trigger warning here. Talking about hearing the, the sounds of babies being burnt alive and smelling that and seeing their bones and how awful it was. From the, those were babies that were born from being impregnated by the, um, from sexual abuse um, from the staff or different people, the school people who are working there, church officials. Um, pretty horrible and awful. Uh, but using intergenerational resiliency and strength to be able to hold space for conversations, to be able to listen to one another and support one another. There are strong arms around you that we are stronger when we are together. My cousin Eddie has this notion. She reminds me, she says, TJ, 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 we as Oneida, we as Native peoples, we do not have a monopoly on trauma. We do not have a monopoly on abuse. We do not have a monopoly on hardship, right? These are the things that this is the tool, restored to these circles are tools that everyone can use for healing um, and to, um, to help. And really this gift of empathy, as my cousin, Eddie Cornelius Groff, um, she reminds me, she's, she says that when you give someone the gift of empathy, you give them a gift that changes them for life. When they're able to see the world through someone else's eyes, you give them the gift of empathy that changes their world, that changes their life forever. You can pause here if you want to look more at this. This is a notes from Eddie Cornelius Groff. Uh, my cousin, who was one of the key people that taught me more about restorative justice, some of their keys and guidelines about how they go through it um, and teaching it the way that they've been taught it as well, too. Um, also, is uh, reached out to by Sarah, and I would like to open the door for others as well, too. For anyone who's curious, I think it'd be a really great experience for anyone who's open to traveling to Oneida, Wisconsin, traveling to be in circle um, with my cousin, Eddie, to be in an Indigenous community with Oneida people, particularly in a community that's very open and inclusive, one that would love to uh, have you all as practitioners get that firsthand experience of that acknowledgement, um, education, and honoring for these Native peoples. And um, so my cousin, my cousin um, here, Eddie, Gentle Directions for Life is the name of their um, consulting group there. Um, and they're a family wellness coach as well. But yeah, just, just curious if, you, if that's pulling on your heart, if you're convicted to curious about this, if you'd ever want to go out to Oneida, Wisconsin, just outside of Green Bay, Austin Straubel Airport in Green Bay, Wisconsin, then reach out to me and let me know. We'd love to set something up. For you all to get that experience as well and you know i love to give you those media recommendations you know i do people unsolicited recommendations here they come at you native graphic novels press pause if you want to check out more but read through one time here we go Redbone, dear woman moonshot volumes one through three seven generations trickster super indian volume one the outside circle 500 years of resistance soldiers unknown mighty code talkers i'm not a number paying the land string man a girl called echo series three feathers uneducation um Ghost River, The Rise and Fall of Con, uh, Conestaga, Native American Classics, Alice, Alice Six Killer. So with that being said, a message here from me sitting alongside my cousin, which is to this, uh, my right, and then to my left of the picture is my grandma there. I just want to say, and that means thank you. I love you. Until next time in Oneida. You are a human being who is worthy of love. Invitation, not an obligation. But if you want it, only if you want it, sit up nice and tall for me. Give me the deepest breath of love you've had all day as you are love. Here we go. Breathe in some love. And exhale some love. You are love. You are worthy of love. It's such an honor to put our minds together. Looking forward to connecting a lot more this week in our group meet. And as always, it's just, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.